Okay, let's begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for the gift of fellowship, the gift of faith. Thank you for the gift of the mother of our Savior. We ask you to send forth your Holy Spirit that we might come to have the grace to respond to your son's call to be a disciple. And we ask his mother for her intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, last week to kind of review where we were, what we're going to do tonight, and then where we're, where we're going. There's only three nights. So last week, we kind of walked through the three big doctrines of Mary, um, that she's the mother of the Savior, that she was conceived without sin, and um, that she was assumed body and soul into heaven, and how those three doctrines speak to us about our own vocations, our own calls. Um, remember we said Mary's the moon, or that's what the early church, would, where that was the symbol the early church used of Mary. Mary is the moon. Uh, the moon is the, what reflects the light of the sun. It has no light of its own. It re reflects the light of the sun, and it, and it, it gives light in the darkness. Uh, and that's how Mary operates. She reflects the light of the sun. Um, everything about Mary points either toward Christ or elucidates something about us. Um, it's her own Right, we don't want to you know, say that's the only thing. I mean, it's her own vocation. She was called to her own yes, and all the grace is given to her. But there's a greater, it's not simply for her own glorification, but there's an element of she's pointing, reflecting the light of Christ, teaching us something about Christ, but also in the process of teaching, teaching us about Christ, she's teaching us about ourselves. And that's why we have the idea that Mary's the mother, the model of discipleship. Um, so then next week, we're going to talk about the rosary, and we're going to talk about the rosary as a prayer of discipleship and what that means. And I'm really going to focus on um, the virtues associated with the mysteries. And I think those are sometimes often forgotten, and how we can use those, uh, the, the meditation on the virtues as a way to help us uh, think about our own lives and examination of conscience. Um, and so instead of just having the rosary, uh, well, we'll get into that next week. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a different way of praying the rosary, and it's uh, a profound way of praying the rosary. Uh, this week, we're going to look at Scripture, and we're going to look at those, those key events throughout Scripture where Mary, namely as the Gospels, where Mary is uh, spoken of, and see what we can glean from it from the viewpoint of what is she teaching us about discipleship. Everything we're about to read and go through is so rich, we could spend you know, a long time just talking about Luke chapter 1. Uh, and the Annunciation and getting into Scripture and how that ties into Marian doctrines and, and, and so forth. But um, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to focus more on the idea of discipleship and what does it mean to say yes to Christ. Because um, that's really what the, the, the three nights are about. Mary, model of discipleship. Um, so with that in mind, I think we're just going to dive right into it. So we're, we're starting the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're going to go... Um, so when it comes to the Gospels um, and, the, and how Mary is portrayed in the Gospels, there's really three times she's present in the Gospels. If we want to add Acts to the Apostles, there's four times. Um, the first time is obviously at the Annunciation when Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you're going to have a son, and then the whole Christmas story, right? Um, that, that, so I guess... I guess technically that's two events, but in our minds, we just put them together. The Annunciation, you're going to have a son, and then she has a son who's named Jesus. And then they have all the emphasis, you know, when she goes, takes Jesus to the temple um, to present him, and you have Simeon, and you have Anna, um, and then you have him in, in, in the, the, the child, uh, the finding of Jesus in the temple. Obviously, those are many events, but I just kind of see that as one event because the Gospel of Luke is basically chapters one and two. Uh, so it's one compact unit of time. Um, and then you have her in the middle of Christ's ministry of where she shows up and, um, 
and they go to Jesus and says, well, your mother and brothers are here. And he goes, well, who are my brother? Who is my mother and who are my brothers and sisters? It's those who do the will of Christ uh, are my mother and brother and sisters. And um, so I'm not going to talk about that uh, particular point because what we'll see is that Mary fulfills that. She does the will of Christ and therefore she is his disciple. She's a disciple par excellence. And that's the answer to that. Uh, then you have the end of the, uh, the, the Gospels of where she's standing at the cross. And we will look at that. And then if you go to the Acts of the Apostles, the last time she's mentioned uh, in an obvious way, like she was there, is um, in the upper room, uh, where Peter and, Peter and the Apostles and 120 are gathered in the upper room, and the mother of Jesus is with them. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes upon the, the Twelve. Often in our own minds, we have this image of just, there's the Twelve sitting around, and all of a sudden, whoo, here comes the Holy Spirit, and the Twelve go out. If you read Acts, there's actually a, a community uh, of believers there. Uh, about 120, in the middle of them was Mary. Um, and, in, and incidentally, if you end up going to the pilgrimage uh, next, next fall, or next, next summer, uh, for Pierre Giorgio's canonization, I saw what's on the itinerary, and I think we'll be going to a church um, in Europa. Uh, and there's this incredible uh, painting of Pentecost. I mean, it's like, it's stunning, a painting, this painting. It is stunning. And, uh, but there's Mary in the middle, and then you have the 12 around, and then you have all the other disciples behind them. So it's a, it really kind of captures that whole uh, essence of Pentecost. But that's a little bit different than what we're talking about. So those are kind of the four areas where Mary's mentioned. We're just going to focus on the, on the first section, and then we're going to focus on uh, the birth of Christ, what we would call the Joyful mysteries, and then we're going to focus on the uh, on the crucifixion. Oh, there's also the wedding at Cana. I totally forgot about that. Everyone's like going, yeah, because that's actually in my notes. We're actually going to be talking about the other e event is the wedding at Cana, yeah. and so I don't know why that slipped my mind, but uh, I would have remembered it when I turned the page. Oh, there's John chapter two we have to talk about. So there's also the wedding at Cana. So we'll talk about those. Those are the those are the events. What happens is birth and childhood, the wedding at Cana, and then. Um, when uh, he's crucified. So with that in mind, Gospel of John chapter 1, and we're going to start all the way back in verse 5 with the story of Zechariah. Uh, and the reason why we're going to start with Zechariah is because when Luke wrote this, he's trying to contrast, he does a lot, there's a lot here, and again, a lot we can go down, but one of the ideas he's, he's getting at is he's contrasting the faith, um, the faith of Mary with the doubt of Zechariah. And so I want to kind of talk about that because there is some stuff that um, are some points to be made about what does it mean to be a disciple. Again, this is the paradigm that we are going to be looking at all this with. So, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of uh, Abijah, Abijah. And, he had a wife, and he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. I want to pause real quickly here and just kind of explain why this is somewhat important. Um, in fact, I want to tie it into yesterday's gospel reading, because the yesterday's gospel was about the rich young man. And there was that line in the gospel of where, the, where Jesus says uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into heaven. And the apostles were amazed and marveled at this idea. And um, so in the course of, you know, as I think most of you know, um, I'm in diaconal formation. God willing, I'll get ordained in February, which means the last uh, first nine months or so of this year, I've taken homiletics. So I've become a little bit more critical listening to homilies. It's not like, you know, that was not a very good point or what, nothing like that, but in the sense of what I do this, and you know, why is he choosing this and not that? And so I started thinking about that um, last night. And, it, it, you know, the reason why they were uh, amazed that Jesus said that is because throughout the Old Testament, a sign of God's blessing was wealth, uh, you know, you, you, you have oxen in abundance, you'll have land in abundance. You have these things, and you have children in abundance. So if you don't 
So if the rich man isn't blessed by God, <laughs> what does that really mean? How can, it, how can it mean that a rich man can't get into heaven? And so here we have the same thing. Even though they're righteous before God, they had no child. So there was no tangible blessing, so to speak. From the, this is the ancient Jewish mind. This is why this, the idea of childhood and childbirth it was so important. Um, so now, we'll go back to verse 8. Now, while he was serving as priest before God... When his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, it fell to him by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So this is priestly duties. They had to enter into the main temple, burn incense, and you were part of different groups of priests. And it was your group's time. You then you would cast lots. Whoever was selected, he would go in, and that was the only time he ever got to do that. Right? So once you went in, then you were no longer part of casting lots. So it was, a, it was kind of a one-and-done thing. So for Zechariah to go in as an old man, and we're assuming, I don't know how old he is, but you know, if his, if his wife has passed childbearing years, let's just put him at 60. Uh, you know, he's been a priest for 40 years, and, he, and this is now his, finally time, his time to go in. So it's a really important time in his life, because he's waiting for it, and waiting for it, and waiting for it. Um, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he, saw, uh, when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John." Another little point, I, want, I, I can't resist some of these points. Um, if Elizabeth is, at, is past childbearing years, so they say they're in their 60s, when did Zechariah stop praying to have a child? There's a point in time, you got to think in his own life, they get married, Lord bless me with children. You know, 20s, 30s, Lord bless me with children. 40s, Lord bless me with children. You get to your 50s, you're like, maybe the answer's been no. Where you kind of give up, you stop, and now all of a sudden your prayers heard. There's an idea that sometimes God, you know, we always like to say God answers prayers in His own time, and here's evidence of it, right? Here's evidence of probably a man who stopped praying for children for at least a decade, and now remember that prayer? Yeah, that's kind of a, a fearful thing for me going facing the Lord. He's like, remember those prayers you prayed? It's like, oh yeah, that's why those things happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, and you will have, so this is uh, Gabriel speaking, um, your prayer has been heard, heard, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he shall drink no, no wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn, from, uh, turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts to the, of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the people a Lord prepared. Basically, this is the prophecy of John the Baptist. So he was one year younger than Jesus. Older. He was older than ah, Jesus. Older, yes. Older. Say, well, we'll, find, we'll have to find out how, exactly how old, much older he was than Jesus. But yes, John the Baptist was older than Jesus. So then we get back to Zechariah. So Zechariah says to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things come to pass, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he made signs to them and remained dumb. And when his time of service was ended, he went home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she hid herself, saying, Thus the Lord has done to me in the days when he looked on me to take away my approach among men. So this is Elizabeth is thanking God because no longer will people look at her and say somehow she wasn't blessed by God. Uh, there's some hidden sin that, 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 that held back that blessing. That would be like the Jewish mentality. Um, so this is the idea, the, the, the kind of point Gabriel comes, 
Zachariah goes, I don't know about this. And he goes, okay, you're not going to talk. Okay? You're not going to talk for nine months. Contrast with what happens with Mary. Verse 26. In the sixth month, the sixth month of what? The sixth month after John the Baptist was conceived. So John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered in, considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Okay, right there, everything is going exactly what happened with Zechariah. Um, Obviously, Mary is not in the temple, but as we talked about last, last week, there's a tradition in the church that Mary was at evening prayer, or prayer in, during evening time, when Gabriel came to her. Um, she is startled, uh, somewhat concerned. Um, he actually says, don't be afraid. Uh, something very similar, do not be afraid, Zechariah, do not be afraid, uh, Mary. So, you know, there's fear. Um, and then Gabriel says what's going to happen, Okay. And then we have Mary. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child, will be, uh, therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who, has been called, who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So why did Mary get off without any type of punishment? Because she asked, right? And, and Zechariah asked. And I think there's a, there's a key. There's a couple keys to help us understand. The first one is that well, let's, let's start with Mary. I think it's probably easier to unlock this riddle starting with Mary. It begins by saying she was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Now, betrothal for the ancient Jews is not like engagement as we understand it. Uh, betrothal, they were legally married, though they, uh, were, no, they were not yet living to, with one another. So the idea that she had a legal marriage. It wasn't like they were waiting to get married. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, and then she goes, well, how can this be since I have no husband? It was kind of an odd statement because she actually kind of has a husband. Okay. So this points to the idea that her and Joseph had to have made uh, what's called a Josephite marriage. They, they had made a vow to be celibate within their marriage. Because technically, if you get really deep into it, it says, how, sh how shall this be? since I have never known a man, which is the Hebrew way, uh, uh, Hebrew way of talking about you know, marital intimacy. Um, and so it's interesting that she asks this question. When she's married, all right, not, not living together, but when, when she is betrothed, betrothed, that she's, I have no husband, I don't have any type of you know, uh, intimacy with a, with a man in that sense, and yet, um, why would she ask the question? Because in her mind, because if this, this puts yourself in her shoes, right? You're on the, uh, uh, on the verge of, engage, of getting married, right? You're, you're betrothed, you're engaged, and you got, you're going to have a son and name Jesus. And you're like going, okay, I want to have kids anyway, right? There's no, there's, I mean, that's not a, a difficult. I'm 15 years old. You know, he's, I guess, probably how old she was, about 15. I'm 15. She, you know, Joseph, 17, 18, 19, 20, somewhere around there. We plan to have lots of kids, and one of them will be named Jesus. The question makes no sense if that was her mind. The fact that she would ask the question implies that she had made a vow of celibacy, and so had Joseph. 
And this is part of what's called the, uh, so there's different communities in ancient Israel. You have the Pharisees. We know all about the Pharisees. You have the Sadducees. We know all about the Sadducees. You have the Zealots. You know, Simon the Zealot was one of the apostles. You have the Herodians. You have the scribes. These are all, all, all groups talked about in Scripture. But there was one group that's not mentioned in Scripture that we know a lot about because we found records of them in 1948 when a young shepherd boy was throwing rocks in, around the, in caves, the caves of the dead, around the Dead Sea, and he heard something break. And he went in to investigate. He found all these jars, and he discovered the Qumran community. And that's where the Essenes lived. And the Essenes were a group of people who were dedicated to serving the Lord in a very radical way out in the desert. And there's evidence and suggestions that um, John the Baptist was associated with them and Jesus had a deep association with them. And I'll just give you one little tidbit on why this is possible, and then we'll move on. But there's a curious scene, and I think it's in the Gospel of Luke, actually, where uh, Jesus says, it's time to prepare for the Passover, go into the city, find the man who's carrying the water, and follow him. What's wrong with that story? Men don't carry water in ancient Jews, in, in Israel. It was not a man's job, period. It was a woman's job, except for the Essenes, because the Essenes lived separately. And incidentally, where the upper room was, that is where the part of Jerusalem where the Essene community was most active. So there's, that's like a key point of showing how Jesus was very connected with his community. And so there's speculation that Mary and Joseph might have been. And, they, and the Essene community did take vows of celibacy. All right. And so there's a lot there. Anyway, my point is, is that Mary says, she, her question is asked out of, okay, I have this vow of celibacy. I don't understand how this is going to happen. Whereas we go to Zechariah, you have an old man, an old woman, they're past their childbearing years, and he goes, how's this going to happen? A Gabriel says, well, because I, I told you it's going to happen, but he also could have said, you know, there's precedence. Have you ever heard of a guy named Abraham and his wife Sarah? I mean, he was 100 and she was 90. So the idea that someone, uh, a couple who's far beyond childbearing years would have a child is part of I mean, it's the foundation of, of the Jewish religion. Abraham is the father of faith. He left his homeland at 75 for the promise to have a child. And now, and this is, I mean, everything is built upon that. Who's the son of promise? It's Isaac. And Isaac is the father of Jacob, and Jacob's the father of the 12 tribes. This is like big stuff. I mean, to, to question this is to question history, the history of your own religion. And so there, Zechariah is doubting something that's happened. Whereas Mary's saying, I don't understand how this is going to happen because it doesn't fit to how I understand how God works. It's something brand new. That's the, the, the key thing. And so we have to be, and uh, so I think my point I want to make here is this idea of trust and what God is asking of us. And this is really comes down to, because she can't possibly understand. He gives her the answer, how's this going to be? I have no husband. He goes, because the Holy Spirit should overshadow you. And she's a younger too. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that in a second. I'll, I'll, I'll have a lot to say about how much Mary knew or didn't know. Yeah. Um, because the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and that's how that conception will happen. It's a miraculous one that, that goes beyond what we understand or how we know human beings come to be. And so this idea of trust, because God will often ask us to do things, and we talked about this last week, how Mary's vocation was singular. I mean, she's the, only, she's the only person in the whole history of the world who was called to be the mother of God. All right? And all of our vocations are not singular. In other words, you know, there are lots of people who are married. There are lots of priests, lots of deacons, lots of potential deacons, lots of husbands, lots of fathers, uh, lots of mothers, lots of wives. Right? These are all vocations, right? Nothing we have is singular. And yet, how often do we do what Zechariah does? And we hey, this can't happen. I don't have that. I don't have this ability. I can't do that. And we doubt. And we doubt, and, we, and then we, we ask for a sign. Because he doesn't sit there and say, I don't believe. He says, how shall I know this? How many of us have, <laughs> have said the prayer, 
Something to the effect of, Lord, can I just have a burning bush? <laughs> right? Just show me the sign and I will do it. And I think the answer is, I don't think so. I don't think if I showed you a sign, you'd be any more willing to do it than if, you, if I didn't show you the sign. Because when Moses got the burning bush, he didn't question God once, twice, or three times, he, had, he questioned God five times and gave five different excuses why he couldn't do what God was asking him to do. And so the first step, we talked about discipleship. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who has made a commitment to follow Christ. Well, what does that mean? It means following Christ in the, our day-to-day -day life. And I will submit to you that the essence of discipleship is this prayer, the prayer that began, that's on the opening sheet, okay? This is called the Shusape. It's by uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. And this is the prayer, if, you, if you're bold enough to say it, then say it. But you're really giving yourself to God. Let's walk, let's walk through it. This is what Mary did. Take, Lord, and receive all of my liberty, all my freedom, I want to give it to you. My memory. Now, memory is a technical phrase for kind of what you think about. What you think about. So you have to have all my thoughts. My understanding is what you kind of desire to know. It's like, you know, uh, so for example, I know lots of things. What do I want to dwell upon? What do I want to think about? And then like, you know, what does the Lord want me to know in an active way where I'm actually pursuing some type of knowledge? It can be, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be academic. This is like very broad, okay? And my entire will. That means everything that I desire, I give it all to you. All that I have and possess. I want you to take it, Lord. Thou hast given all to me, to thee, O Lord, I return it. And then, like the most petrifying line of them all, all is thine, dispose of it wholly according to thy will. Give me thy love and thy grace, for this is sufficient for me. So you're handing him your, your whole life. Um, you know, have you heard of Scott Hahn? Mm -hmm. A lot of people have heard of Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn's wife is Kimberly. And when Scott converted, Kimberly did not convert, and she was actually thinking about divorcing him. She was getting to counsel for, get, to do divorce, uh, for divorce and stuff, and she went to her dad, who was a preacher, and her dad said, are you praying that prayer that I taught you? And she said, no, I'm not. And, the prayer, and he goes, well, I think you need to start doing it before we make any decision. I don't have the prayer memorized, but it was something to the effect of, uh, Lord, I will go where you want me to go, do what you want me to do, say what you want to me to say, just make the path clear to me. She refused to say that prayer because of what it might lead her to. And that was conversion. So this is what, this is what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who goes, yeah, I'll, I'll follow you, Jesus. And he's like, really? I don't know about that. Are you willing to kind of go wherever I want you to go? And so this is the prayer of the disciple, the prayer uh, I, was, I would recommend that you pray every single day. Um, and you're just kind of giving yourself to God because you don't know where he's, going to go, where he's going to lead you. And the idea of trust is also important. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately because, as I mentioned, God willing, I'll get ordained to the diaconate in three and a half months. And so last week, I was actually talking to a, a priest friend of mine. And he goes, oh, how's it going? And I said... Oh, some days I'm, uh, I, it feels pretty good, and other days I'm trying to figure out how do I get myself out of this mess. And uh, unlike you, he didn't laugh. He was not, because that's not very funny at all. He didn't say that, but I could tell by the look on his face. And I said, well, look. And I got back to him. I said, look, you know, I was married. My wife and I celebrated 25 years this year. I said, when I got married, uh, I'm, the vows, you know, in sickness and health, in good times, bad times, sickness and health. What, how's that, what's the other one? Uh, everyone's forgotten. It's like, oh, you know. Uh, <laughs> What? Uh, money, uh, uh, rich, rich, rich or poor, good time. And so when I was 24, I got married. I was like, yeah, rich, uh, happiness, good time. What's all this other negative stuff? That's never going to happen to us, right? Because you're so naive. You're thinking about it. And then all of a sudden you get married, and all of a sudden life comes at you. And I've had a blessed marriage, okay? It has not been bad. But there's been hard, hard times. Where it's like, it hasn't been like, you know, all, you know, care bears and clouds uh, all the time which is kind of good because, you know, care bears and clouds, but no one's laughing at me, okay. Um, but no, seriously, it, but now at 50, I'm looking into it and thinking to myself, I know what's in store for the next 25, 30 years. There's a lifelong commitment. 
right? And so there has to be that level of, of trust because I don't know what's going to happen. I know there's going to be good things, but also going to be a lot of difficulties because it's the nature of being a leader in a community. And the diaconate is one where you give yourself to the service of the bishop and the pastor whom you're under. It's a lifelong commitment. And so it's not something you just kind of, it's not, I'm just going to volunteer in a new way and then I'm kind of tired of this, I'll just walk away. That's not what it is. So this idea of trust, of saying, I'm going to give myself to you, Lord, and wherever you lead me, I'm going to trust that. I'm going to trust that you lead me down the path that you want me to go. And that's a really profound idea. So a disciple is someone who says yes to the Lord and seeks to follow his path, uh, the best of his or her ability in the life he or she has been given with a trust that says, you know, what happens to me is for my own ultimate good, even if I don't necessarily understand it at this moment. If I don't understand it at this moment. Um, because he's an all-good God. And as we know, as we'll, we'll see, Mary did not have the easiest life. The easiest life. Um, and it goes back to her knowledge, too. The idea that what did Mary know. Um, we'll, get, we'll talk about this later on. But Mary, because she was without sin... That means her mind was not darkened by sin. So she had an intellect which, which goes beyond anything that we understand. And she could read scripture because uh, she was a little Hebrew girl and, and, and there's a good chance she knew how to, at least, if she couldn't read scripture, she at least heard it. And she heard it in a way that we don't hear it because she's without sin. She was, she was, her mind was illumined in a way that our minds isn't. And so when she found out she was going to be the mother of the Savior, well, she knew what the Savior was going to go through. She wouldn't know the specifics. She wouldn't know the crucifixion was waiting for him, but she knew that a hard life that ended in uh, death was waiting for him. And so by saying yes to this, she was saying yes to the whole vocation to be the mother of the one who was going to carry the sins of the world. And she might not have understood the way that I'm, I'm, the words I'm using, because we have 2,000 years of history, theology, ways of talking that were not privy to her, but at the same time, I guarantee you she understood in a way I don't understand it, even if the words were a little bit different. So when she said yes, it was like, yeah, good times and bad times, they're both coming my way. Um, I embrace it fully. This idea of trust that we just embrace everything that the Lord is willing to give us, that's a hard thing to do, which is why the susape, that prayer, is so important, because it reminds us that it's your will, not mine, and all I have to do, all I have to do, is submit, and, and, uh, and that's a hard enough thing to do. Anyway, that's the first point, the idea of trusting in God, heading our lives over to him, and following him as he unfolds the path in front of us. Then, notice, as moment, the moment the angel leaves, right? So she says, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Next verse, in those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judea, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Why would she go to Elizabeth? Well, there's two reasons. First reason is like more, I guess, kind of the more obvious reason, at least in terms of a, if she's the mother of the Lord and Elizabeth is the mother of the one who will announce the Lord, it would make sense that they come together. But perhaps the more practical reason is that they were kinswoman, and that she went to go help her older kinswoman in the final three months of pregnancy. So the moment she says yes to God, I accept the vocation you want to give me, and I'll trust, she turns herself, her, her eyes away from herself out toward others. And so it, we talk a lot about this at Pierre Giorgio Persati Catholic Church, the idea of ad intra and ad extra. You go into yourself, you go inward, find God, pray to God, so you turn back around and you can go at extra, which is to go out and to see the needs of those around us. And that's, what the, 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 that's, that's the, the twofold element. It goes back to Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, I think, uh, where Jesus, uh, he invites the 12 up the mountain so they can be with him and that then he can send them out. That twofold reality of being with the Lord in order to be sent out. And so disciples, you know, we always have to kind of be aware, Lord, you know, you're going to bless me, you're going to call me, but that calling and blessing is ultimately to be outward focused, not just focused on, you know, inner peace and, you know, harmony within us. And those are good things, but we're not a, um, a Christianity is not a religion that sits and is all about 
denying self and trying to find an alignment within ourselves. It's all about meeting God and then turning around and bringing God to others in concrete, practical ways. Um, and so we see that with Mary. She's called, and then she, then she is immediately sent out. Um, and turn with me now to the Gospel of, John, Gospel of Luke chapter 2. We're going to skip all the other stuff uh, and go right to chapter 2. Now, you know these stories, but I think it's just kind of a... Um, I'm trying to look at my time, trying to balance how much I want to read and how much I need to talk. Um, I think I just want to read it. I think I want to read all of chapter 2. I think the reason why is because so often, especially us Catholics, I've taught, this, I've taught, I've taught enough to know that I guess it really hit home. I, my second or third class I ever taught, and I was in my early 30s, and uh, it was a Bible study. So I said, okay, pull out your Bibles, and no one brought one. And I was like, okay, well, I'm talking to Catholics. It's a Bible study, and no one brings their Bible. And the idea was it's just to talk about Scripture without actually looking at Scripture. And I think there's power within Scripture, and so I want to just read all of chapter, chapter 2 and let you go. You've heard these stories. It's the birth of Jesus. It's when he meets Simon. Uh, Mary meets uh, Simeon and Anna, and it's when he's down in the temple. But to hear the stories... So we have a framework of kind of what we're going to be talking about, okay? I think that's really important. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from, a city, up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was one, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in an inn. And in that region there were shepherds out in the, in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, and you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with, there, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, uh, praising God and saying, "Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased." When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has, been ha that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying which had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their, pur for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. 
And when the parents brought him, brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou, thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to thy people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was a great age, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and as a widow till she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, uh, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to God and spoke of him to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the company, in the company they went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. And he said to them, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in, his, in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Okay. Long chapter. There's basically just one point I want to make. it, And that's twice we hear that Mary kept all these things in her heart. And then once we hear that she was marveled at what was being told her, and that was from what Simeon says. We can only assume she also kept that in her heart. It wasn't like just these two things, I forgot everything else. She kept all these things in her heart. So a disciple is someone who trusts in God, a disciple is someone who is outward looking, and a disciple is someone who is prayerfully reflective on how God acts in his or her own life. This is like really important. Because often I think as Catholics, we think that prayer is, okay, I'm going to get my rosary, which is kind of something ironic for me to say that because we're going to talk about the rosary next week. But, you know, we're going to pray the rosary, we're going to go to Mass, we have our Hail Marys, we have our Our Fathers, we have our Glory Bees, we have our devotions. And prayer is much deeper than that. At the heart of it, it is a relationship with God. And that God is active in our lives. The only way we can, we can begin to reflect or, or know how God is active in our lives is if we actually reflect on what God is doing in our lives. There's moments of time where we have to kind of step away. And so when I talk about prayer, for, I mean, think about what Mary did. You know, she, she, she has a child in a cave, more or less. Uh, she, the swaddling clothes is a beautiful image. It was rags. That's what it really means. It was rags. Um, it was a feeding trough, right? We got to get the, 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 the crest scene, as beautiful as that is, out of our heads. Okay, because sometimes that image saturates or, 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 or kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, disinfects the, the reality of what really happened. And also the angels show up. I mean, that's the, angels, the shepherds. We saw angels. And she starts thinking about these things, you know? And she knows scripture. She knows the Messiah must be born in Bethlehem. And, and she, she knows what happened to her with the Annunciation. She's in Bethlehem. 
And so she has to, there's an element of what is God doing? Where is God leading us? Um, though she, she had to walk in faith and she had to walk with trust. You know, she knew she was the mother of the Savior. She did not know. And she knew the Savior had to be born in Bethlehem, but she did not know the Savior would be born in a manger, in a cave, outside of Bethlehem, wrapped in, wrapped in rags and put in a feeding trough. She wouldn't know those things. So the idea that she would reflect upon why is God doing this, the humility of God that would have had to have been exposed and revealed to her in this way. To think that God, if, if Jesus is God, which he is, then he could have chosen to be born for a, in any circumstance he wanted to be born in. And so he didn't choose to be born in a palace of gold. He chose to be born in a cave and wrapped in rags. That was his choice. It reveals something about God. It reveals something about his love for us and also his humility. You know, he identifies in a certain way. I'm not the king who's going to come out and like lord it over you, but he's one of the people, so to speak. And he comes forth from the people and he understands the hardships of people. He didn't live, uh, wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He didn't live a life of privilege. These were all things she would think about. And then think about what Simeon said. You know, I've, you know he takes, we're going to go back to a, a page, um, my own eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for the people of Israel behold and then he says to Mary behold this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign that is spoken against and a sword will pierce your own heart or it says in this translation your own soul that the thoughts of many, of many hearts will be revealed her own, her own suffering within his life her own, the, the own aches she would have to feel. These were the things she would kind of contemplate and reflect upon. The, the heaviness of her own vocation. But, you know, the vocations are not... If we're given a vocation to carry out... And like we talked, we talked about last week with St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, she had many vocations, and so does everyone in this room. It's not like, okay, well, this is it, and I'm just on track, and I'm never going to be dissuaded for anything again. We're constantly being called throughout our lives in different, different ways to respond to the Lord in different... Uh, as, he, as he opens up this path that we're walking down. You know, I, we like to think that the highway, the, the, the road that the Lord has leading us on is not a road which is perfectly illuminated all the way to heaven. It's a road where we can probably maybe see like four, four feet in front of us, five feet in front of us. It's step by step. It's an act of faith. We don't really know where we're going uh, or how we're going to get there. We're just being led, right? And so it's the next step. Okay, Lord, now what's next? Next, what's next? And what we want to do is we want to plan and organize everything all laid out. And you know, my life is now perfectly planned and never will be disrupted. We all know how foolish that is. Um, and then think, you know, the, the idea that in the, in the temple, um, they lose. See, I want to talk a little bit about this because someone, someone once asked me, well, weren't Mary and Joseph bad parents since they, they left their kid in Jerusalem? I was like, well, first of all, I think it says Jesus chose to stay behind. Okay, I think that's kind of the first thing. But really, um, in those days, you didn't just go, hey, we're going to go from, from, from Galilee, which is up here, to Jerusalem is down here. And they talk about going up to Jerusalem. It's kind of odd. If you're coming from the north, going to the south, how are you going up? Because Jerusalem's on a hill. So you have to go up, uh, up to Jerusalem. Um, you didn't go by yourself. You went with a, with a caravan, a group of people. And so I'm sure they all got assembled, and so the and Jesus was 12, kind of a ding, a, a little key point. So he was right at that perfect age of where he could slip away without being noticed, because he was old enough to be with the men, but he was still young enough he could be with the woman. So, and that's how they traveled. And so Mary go, oh, he must be with Joseph, and Joseph go, oh, he must be with his mother. And they get they travel a day, they. Camp, and they go, well, where's our kid? It's like, he's nowhere to be found. So if they've traveled a day, they have to travel a day back. And then they spend a day looking. So that's how you get, to, I think that's the three days. That's how I calculate the three days. And so I always I suspect, they go, oh, he, he might be in the temple, right? They know who he was. They, they, they experienced this. They, they, they talked. Remember, the angel Gabriel just didn't show up to Mary. Who else did she show up to? Yeah. Joseph. Right? So he was aware of this too. And so they went to the temple, they had this event, and how do you not know I wouldn't be my, in my father's house? Um, and she ponders this. So how the Lord is acting in her life is that point of prayer. And so it's, 
reflect, ask, ask the Lord. I don't know if you've done this before. I don't know everyone in this room on, on this deep of a level, but what, Lord, what are you doing in my life right now? Where, where, where are you acting? What are, what's being uh, communicated to me? What's, what am I experiencing? Who am I meeting? What's going on? Because if we believe that God loves us unconditionally, which we do, then that means he's, we're not just a number. We're not just like, you know, oh, there's a whole mass of people and I just have no idea what I'm going to do with those people. I just kind of let them be led by a group. No, he's with us personally on a personal basis, speaking to us in an individual way every step of our every moment of our lives. He's more interested in what we're doing than we're interested in what we're doing. He's more interested in our salvation than we're interested in our salvation. And he's constantly reaching out to us. I think, did I say this? I can't remember who I said this to. I think I said this to this group. But um, Christianity is unique of all the religions because in every religion there is, it's humankind is looking for God, seeking for God. If we just fast this way, we can find God. If we pray this way, we can find God. If we go to this point, we can find God. Christianity is fundamentally different because God is seeking us. He's the one who calls Abraham. He's the one who calls Isaac and Jacob. He's the one who calls Moses. He's the one who gives the commandments. Here's what you need to do to be united with me. It's not elusive. It's not like, oh, I have no idea what God wants. And we all think that, but that's not how it is. And then Jesus comes. The Son of God becomes man to tell us. He's the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's constantly coming to us. And so he's walking with us. And so I would encourage you, if he's walking with us, start reflecting upon your own life because that's the next kind of the key. If, if you want to know what it means to follow God and to trust God, you have to know how God is acting in your life. It's not in some abstract way. It's up close. It's personal. And he's, he's, he's closer than we can possibly imagine. And he's leading us in ways that we, can poss- we can't possibly imagine. And so it's becoming a prayerful person, reflecting and pay, taking some moments and saying, okay, Lord, just being open it. It's very simple. Lord, what are you doing in my life? Reveal it to me. If you act in all sincer- ask that in all sincerity, he will. I mean, he wants, to, <laughs> he wants to be known. He wants you to know him. He wants, has a plan for you. He wants that plan to be known. He's not going to sit there and say, oh, nice try. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, you know pick a card, any card. You know, it's not going to be guesswork. He wants it. But it's an act of faith, right? Because, we want, because what happens is when we start being told in various ways, I think that's the answer, and he he'll kind of makes himself known, we become like who? Zechariah. Well, how can I possibly know this? And so we kind of are our own worst enemies. Okay. Next, Gospel of John, chapter 2. Um, On the third day, Again, this is a story we all know, the wedding at Cana. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now six stone jars were standing there, each for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. And when the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, The steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first sign, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Again, a story we've heard many, many, many times. And um, I want to focus on, okay, so... The title or the theme that we're having this week and the, and the weeks around on either side of it is Mary, the model of discipleship. So I want to look at this not so much in terms of what Mary teaches us about what we ought to do, 
but teaches us how we ought to act as a disciple. So she becomes the model of how we ought to act. And so, again, she sees a need. She goes to the Lord with the need. And then she looks at the people and she says, well, do whatever he tells you to do. And I think this is what it means to be a disciple. When people come to us for advice, and I'm, I'm keenly aware of this because of my kids. You know, I'm at the, I'm at the age of where... Uh, you have, because my youngest is, is 16, my oldest is 23, going on 24, and so there, there's a shift that takes place as parents. You go from command to counsel, right? And it's just what happens, because there, there's a point in time that you've got to make their own decisions and, and, and uh, you know, for good or for ill. And uh, there's also a point in time where you can't possibly know what the best decision is. You don't have your own advice. But the problem is, that what I kind of find myself thinking about a lot is, am I giving him, them, the best advice, or my advice, or I'm, give, I'm teaching them to look to what Christ would do. And so often, it's like, well, no, this is what you need to do. And I'm just going to tell you, right? Because I'm right. You, just, you know, I have, you know, you, pull, you play that card. Well, you know, I'm 50 and you're 17, so I think there's a difference in wisdom here. Um, but you play, this, you play this card, but you don't really know. And I, I referenced my 17-year-old because last night we were down by the fire pit and he started talking about college. And he's more worried about this than he's letting on. He, he, he pretends like he's calm, cool, and collected. And for the most part, he is. But there's a pressure there uh, that he's, he's begun, uh, I, I've sensed in him. And what I realized as I was talking to him is that, you know, there, and I realized with all my kids, but, you know, again, it was kind of another re realization last night, is that I can't possibly understand uh, you know, or uh, give him the advice that go, you have to go this way and this is how it's going to be perfect. If you do this and this, your life will have, you know, this is the perfect path. Because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the Lord's leading them to. I don't know what, who he needs to meet and, and, and so forth. Um, and what those schools or different schools really allow. So it, it, what it comes down to, I can go, here's what I think you need to think about, but you have to pray. You know, you have to ask the Lord, what, what do I need to do? Because I, I can't give you that answer. And... Um, he, he, he doesn't like it when I tell him what I think he should do. He doesn't like that answer either. Because, you know, what he wants is like, you know, John, look at me. Here's the burning bush, right? And that's what he wants. He wants, he wants the sign and have all his problems go away. But and so as disciples, we have to be very aware of that. And I think it, it, that when people come to us for advice and um, or when we start counseling, and some of us, you know, I was just, Rosemary sitting right here, and she went through called and gifted with us, and we had that joke that, you know, Rosemary kind of walks around the store and says, please talk to me, because uh, people just come up to her and just start talking to her randomly. No one does that to me. They all go, well, I don't want to talk to that guy. But people do come, they do it to you, but, you know, but they'll come to you, whether it's like they're flocking to you like Rosemary, or they come to me because they want something, or they come to you, say, I, I need some advice. We have to be careful to always think, what would the Lord do? So we pray, you know, take, you know, Lord, I need some help in this. And then we can give them the advice, but it's like, you have to pray about it too. And what would, the, what would, do whatever he tells you to do. I can give you some things to think about, but in the end, you have to pray. And we're always referring someone back to the Lord. And that's like the key, the hallmark, because to be a disciple is to make other disciples. And how do you make other disciples? By sending them to the Lord so they can begin to pray. So they have an interaction with the Lord. So they then know what it's like for Christ to speak to them. And then they have their own path they follow. And then they have to say, the, you know, take Lord and receive. They're back where Mary was, right? The Lord's now speaking to them. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. This is like the cycle that happens. You know, Mary was the one who received the word. And then she became, in a certain sense, the angel Gabriel at the wedding at Cana. Do whatever he tells you to do. And that's what, that's what it is. It's, 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 we're trying to make disciples of other people, which is always referring them back to the Lord. Always. It's, it, we're, like, it, we're like John the Baptist, right? You know, him. It's him, not me. It's him. That's who you need to go to. Um, so that's kind of should always be in our mind. And finally, let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Um, It's on the last page. I'm not going to read the whole thing. This is the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, so it, it starts off, verse 1, Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Um, and this is where, you know, they chant. We, we hear this every single Good Friday, I believe, is the Gospel of John. 
you know, crucify him, crucify him. Um, he makes the sign, um, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He carries the cross out to Golgotha. He gets, um, he gets crucified. They start throwing dice for his clothes. And then in verse um, 25, we have a shift from this horrible scene to this, excuse me, the scene of intimacy between him and his mother and the beloved disciple. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his, took her to his own home. Again, there's a lot to talk about. We talk about Mary being the spiritual mother of us. We talked about that last week. We can talk about um, you know, the, the role of the beloved disciple. But I want to talk about the, the final thing that we, that we really don't want to like to talk about, and that's the idea of suffering. And I don't mean suffering because suffering is going to come our way. You know, I, I, used to, I always joke that if, you've, if you're a Star Wars fan, um, you know, in the first Star Wars movie, C-3PO says, suffering is our lot in life, right? This is, that's how I, 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 I think about it, and we, we all associate that. There's parts of life, it's just part, to be a human being alive means we're going to suffer in some way, shape, or form. And I don't mean in all the possible ways we can suffer, right? Because we know illness is going to come, we know death is going to come, we know heartache, failure, all those things are going to happen, okay? But I mean here, the suffering because of your vocation. Why is Mary at the foot of the cross? Because she said, yes, 35 years earlier, let it be done to me according to thy will. And so taking upon us that, you know, and we know what this means in terms of a like husband and wife and mother and father. We all suffer uh, uh, because, for the sake of and sometimes because of our spouses and for the sake of and sometimes, well, a lot because of our kids and jobs and so forth, but you got to think, you know, if you're called to be a disciple, you're called to be that witness, suffering and persecution is going to come your way by virtue of the fact you're just trying to live a life that Christ is asking you to live. It's just going to happen. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's the, it's the eighth beatitude, you know, blessed are those who are persecuted for the kingdom of God. It, it's going to happen, and, and it's a point of where we say, yes, that's part of it. Um, so often I have found myself you know, uh, thinking, you know, why is this, why is God allowing this to happen? I mean, I've said yes to him. And it's precisely because I said yes to him that he's allowing it to happen. You can't walk with the Lord without having some type of suffering come your way because you've said yes. Uh, and so embracing that, that, that moment of the cross and realizing that that's when we're most united to we're, We can we unite all of our sufferings to him, right? All, to, to the crucifixion, everything we endure whether it's physical or psychological or emotional, whether it has to do with you know, anything that you can imagine. But really, um, for me, and that's what I want to communicate to you guys, is that when we say yes to the Lord, don't be surprised. And what we say yes to becomes a point of persecution and suffering by the very fact that you said yes to it. And that's something that we need to embrace and, and realize that Mary said yes to I'll be the mother of the Savior, which meant 35 years later, roughly thereabouts, she's standing at the cross, you know, watching her son die a horrible death. Uh, and yet, on the other side of it, she was also the one, uh, according to tradition, was the first one he appeared to when he rose from the dead. Uh, and then she was there at Pentecost and received, was that there for the outpouring. So she was there on the other side of it, too. But to pass through that, that, that crucifixion and suffering is a part of what it means to be a disciple, and we can't ever get away from it. So just by way of summary, there were kind of five big ideas I wanted to communicate tonight. The first one is trust. Trusting what God has to, has to lead us to, uh, that he, he, when he calls us, and it can be scary. Uh, I think I said last week, he'll never ask us to do something we can't do, but he'll often ask us to do things that are far outside our comfort zone, uh, which is certainly bad enough. You know? uh, service to others, being outward focused. Uh, what others, the needs of others, uh, prayer and pondering how God is acting in our own lives. The rosary is great. The mass is great. All these other things are great. I'm not going to say they're, they're, they're bad, but we, have to, we need to add something. Moments of time where we reflect on how God is moving in our lives. That's the only way we can hear him, to begin to discern those movements. Uh, referring all things back to Christ, especially when we're trying to help people, 
you know, do whatever he tells you to do. I can counsel you, but in the end, you got to pray, and you got to make the decision. John Paul II was notorious, notorious is probably the best word, but he was known that he would, people go to him for, for, for spiritual direction all the time, and he never told anyone what to do. He asked them questions, he helped them think it through, and he said, because you have to pray and you have to decide. And that's all we can do. Uh, we can be critical in our questions and help them you know, think deeply about something, but in the end, prayer, do whatever he tells you to do. And then finally, realizing that we're going to suffer at times, the sword's going to pierce our heart when we say yes to the Lord, um, and that's part of it, and we need to embrace it as part of being a disciple. So, uh, I think I will conclude with a prayer, uh, and then I'll stick around and answer any questions that anyone might have. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. Have a good night.